Okay, cool. So, moving swiftly along. Um, next up, and I have to be very nice to him because he's a colleague of my wife's. Um, we have uh, we have Fran Garcia from Hosted Graphite, and he'll be talking about full mesh IPsec network, um, ten do's and five hundred don'ts. We could be here some time. Thanks. Can you hear me now? Yeah, it helps if I unmute myself. Um, can you raise your hand if you have some degree of familiarity with IPsec? Do you know what it is? Do you know what it does? Okay, fair amount of people. You should be here, not there. Uh, can you please raise your hand if you would rather I talk about literally anything else? <laughs> oh, okay. Sucks to be me. Uh, okay. Um, quick disclaimer I have material for at least two hours, so I'm going to try to be very, very, very quickly. Uh, I will probably left out some bits. Uh, but the slides are there and they provide the whole context. So I thought it would be better to do it that way. Uh, the questions I, I kind of hope to answer is what's this IPsec thing anyway? What actually is, what can you use it for? Uh, why would you want to use it in a full mesh aside from a more traditional, you know, tunnel to tunnel uh, kind of situation? And in how many ways we actually screwed up implementing it? Spoiler a, a lot. Um, our requirements, uh, you can probably see uh, when you, uh, with the talk advances, there are two main differences between my talk and Patrick's. Number one is he knows what he's talking about. Uh, number two is he likes spending money on network hardware, and we don't. Uh, we don't control our networking gear. We can't depend on it. Uh, we can have multiple clusters across multiple providers, so we can't rely on our network hardware doing the IPsec tunneling for us, so we need a solution for our VPN that didn't have anything to do with any of that. And it also had to be very simple because we're a very small company and it has to be performant enough to deal with all the amounts of traffic that we're putting it through. So this is the quick version. It's actually kind of awful in the sense that IPsec allows you for a lot of flexibility, but there's not a lot of people that are actually using it in the ways that we're actually using it as full mesh. That's a very bad combination because it's like, you don't have good documentation, to, you have, don't have good enough best practices to use it. Um, so very quick introduction to IPsec. IPsec is not a protocol, it's a protocol suit. If you go to Wikipedia and type IPsec, you will have an article with 66 RFCs linked. So you can start reading now, and maybe in a week you can come out later. Uh, so it's very, very complex. Uh, in a nutshell, what it can do, it can help you encrypt your data, it can help you authenticate the source of your data. It can help you verify your data. Uh, you can do one of those, all of those, or none of those, and you can have 100 choices for every single thing. Um, it mainly uh, offers you two protocol, authentication header, or encapsulated security payload, CLDR, if you want to encrypt your data, use CSP. Um, you can also have to show a tuner, transform mode, basically means do I want to, encapsul to encapsulate only the payload of the packets I'm sending at the AP layer, or do I want to encapsulate the whole thing? Again, tunnel mode, it's good if you're doing a side-to-side um, -side, um, tunnel, for example. Transform mode works very well if you're doing host-to-host -host and has like less overhead. Um, security policy is basically the way we tell the kernel what traffic uh, do we want to, um, to be protected by IPsec or not. So you can say something like, oh, any traffic that goes from host A to B, you'll do CSP in transform mode. But any traffic that's using port 443, that's SSL, they don't use IPsec at all. That's stored in the, inside the kernel, and what we call the security policy database. Um, the security association is what we call a, a connection between peers, it's an actual negotiated connections uh, that's protected between peers. It's unidirectional from any two hosts that need to talk to each other, you'll have two. Um, that's also stored inside the kernel, inside what we call the security station database. Um, all of this is negotiated by what's called the Internet Key Exchange, which is a ridiculously complex protocol um, that's used to negotiate all the keys and algorithms that will be used to secure the connections themselves. This is actually the only bit of all this IPsec uh, that lives in user space and not uh, inside the kernel. It has two phases, phase one and phase two. In phase one, we just set the tunnel, which we'll later use to actually negotiate the, the security associations themselves. Um, and phase two is when the actual security associations are done. This 
done this way because you can set the phase, phase one once and then you can make multiple phase twos without the overhead of doing the phase one. Um, this is very quickly the life of an API packet. When it, whenever a packet arrives, uh, your kernel would check the security policy. If IPC is not required for that particular packet, everything's fine, you don't need to do anything else. If this, we'll check if we have a security session currently with our host. If we have, we'll just use it, and we need to create or encrypt packet, and everything's fine. If we don't, we notify any key management demon that we have um, in the user space, tell them to do a negotiation for us, and once they have a security session, we just use it. That bit at the bottom is the only one that happens in user space. Everything else happens inside the kernel. So what, what good has IPsec for us? The main thing is, as encryption happens inside the kernel, it's very, very fast. It's not any VPN that happens in user space that's gonna uh, become a bottleneck if you're sending reasonable amounts of traffic. Uh, if you have the right algorithm and settings for it, it can be very secure. Um, as complex as it is, it's a standard which means a lot of people have been using it and there are a fair amount of good practices for, for it. It's also very flexible. So now we're looking at traditional model, uh, model with a full mesh. This is what will usually look like. You have two data centers or two locations. They have a router at the edge. They have a tunnel between them. Every traffic uh, between them is protected. Every traffic between these house over there is probably in clear text. Uh, full mesh will be to just remove all those two routers and just have everybody can talk to each other uh, uh, with a protected uh, connection. Why do we think uh, full mesh is important? The quickest thing I can explain to you is with this picture, I don't know if you recognize this. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, this part of the Snowden leaks, this is an NSA document. Uh, basically what it shows is traffic from uh, Google users uh, is protected by SSL until it gets to the load balancer where SSL is terminated and everything from there to the right is on clear text. All traffic between Google data centers will have in clear text and the NSA engineers were very happy with that because they're like, I don't care about the part of the left, I just need to tap onto the part of the right. So that means in this day and age, you can't really assume that any part of a network is secure if you don't make sure that the traffic that goes through it is actually secure. So we just trade everything inside the network as potentially compromised. So we decided to do IPsec. Um, bit of context, we had very, very big time constraints. Uh, we were using another VPN solution and it was very unreliable. It was preventing us from scaling. We tried to find other people using IPsec in the same way we wanted to use it. And we only had, only found one company. If you only watch one IPsec presentation today, it sucks to be you because you're here. If you have a place for two, Pedro did get a very, big, a very good one in uh, 2015. So we give it a go. Um, we roll IPsec in our protection cluster. <laughs> it did not go well. We planned for as much as we could, but sometimes things just don't work. Uh, I think everything was broken for two days and it took us like a whole week to actually stabilize the whole production cluster. We found a lot of things that we didn't find there in testing. So we kind of went back to the drawing bar, back to the basics. It took us three months overall to um, roll everything out. Probably the worst three months of my life. Uh, I think I aged like five years, those three months. Uh, things are stable now and we think, we believe that we have learned a lot. Um, it's, it's totally worth it. So our stack, uh, we have hundreds of hosts using ESP in transport mode. Several clusters completely isolated from each other. You can talk to each other at all. We use Raccoon as our key management daemon. Um, very quickly going through our config. This is all the, the firewall config that's IPsec related. Basically, we just allow any IPsec traffic for the negotiations to happen. And if the traffic is uh, protected by IPsec, we just allow it. We don't have any other explicit port openings or um, IP based openings or whatever. We just rely on IPsec doing that for us. That simplifies a lot of rules, um, which is nice. This is what a security policy looks like. Um, 
for IPsec tools, basically is traffic from this host to that particular host protected the IPsec on the same in, in the other direction. If you have something like a Puppet Master or a Syslog server that you want everybody to have access to, but only one particular port, you can't do it. Just say, oh, only allow access for that particular port and that's it. This has the nice side effects that only access to that port would be allowed by the firewall. You don't have to worry about anything else. Um, it's probably a good idea for us to exclude traffic like SSH or ICMP for IPsec. Uh, so we explain later. These are our configs. I'm going to skip them because they're not particularly important. They just serve for context. This is what we believe are good configs. And now we go for the do's and don'ts. There are no 10 do's in you just couldn't find it, sorry. Uh, do not use Raccoon, it's terrible. <laughs> um, it's really terrible, it's not well on time, it's buggy, it just so happens the only thing that worked. So it has that going for us, I suppose. Uh, Libre Swan is a very nice looking alternative. We haven't tested in production. I can say for Raccoon that the only other company that we know of that's doing a very similar thing uh, is also using Raccoon. So I don't know what that says about them or what says about Raccoon. Uh, do not blindly force all traffic to go through IPsec. Do not just say, oh, if you go, go, go from host A to host B, just use IPsec. You're gonna get in trouble. Uh, consider excluding SSH because it's a very fundamental protocol. Consider, consider excluding ICMP because it's nice to ping another host and know that the network works or it doesn't and not your IPsec config. Do you want to be able to differentiate between the two. Um, this is something that happens to, to us. If you're migrating for existing VPN, also exclude that traffic. You don't want to make your VPN be encapsulated through your new VPN while your new VPN doesn't work. I know this from a friend. It doesn't work. <laughs> um, from, uh, do not just enable DPD very quickly. DPD is what it's called dead peer detection. It's a liveness check. It basically works on phase one relationships in IPsec. And if he hasn't heard from the other host for a while, it's that, oh, this guy might be dead. I'm pinning him. If the pin doesn't work, it deletes all associations. It's a very nice idea. It's very useful, but you're gonna be shocked by this. Raccoon's implementation is terrible. Um, so in our case, what happened is it ended up generating hundreds and hundreds of associations between two hosts, um, which the kernel was very, very unhappy about. So we ended up saying, okay, we can't actually have uh, that peer detection. Problem is, you can just not have it uh, because it's legitimately useful, right? So what happens if you have two hosts and one of the hosts crashes? Um, you'll have something like this, like picture you have two hosts, you have vendor, you have flexo, both of them have two security associations with each other. They can talk to each other. They're both happy, right? But say that, for, for example, vendor crashes. When the server crashes, any associations in the database are gone. So you have Flexo that believes it has two associations with vendor, everything's fine. Vendor believes it has no associations whatsoever with Flexo. If Flexo tries to talk to vendor, it will be using an association the vendor knows nothing about, so it will drop all traffic. The server will, will be completely unable to talk to the other server, but will have no indication that that's the case, because traffic will just be dropped. Um, you can just wait for the association to the right side to expire, or you can just tell the vendor to talk to Flexo, it will trigger renegotiation, everything will be fine. But that's kind of weird. So two very hacky workarounds, the obvious one, we can patch Raccoon. It's a two-line patch. We have a, a experimental patch running our stack, kind of seems to work, but who wants to you know, maintain your own fork of Raccoon anyway? And it's not like there's an upstream to, be, to, you know, to talk about. The trivial, just tell the logs. Just tell the logs, and it's a very obvious error message when it happens, and you can just paint the other house and trigger a situation, and you're fine. It's terrible, yes, it works, yes. Um, this is an interesting case 
that we also found. Imagine the same example that we had. Uh, you have Bender, you have Flexo, they can talk to each other, everybody's happy. Now, the, instead of Bender completely crashing, imagine there's only one association dice. Um, this is kind of like a weird situation because now Bender believes it can send data to Flexo, which is completely fine. But every time Flexo can tries to talk back to Bender, it can't because the association that will allow Bender to receive traffic is gone. So you can't actually come back from this by triggering a renegotiation because both sides believe they have associations that allow them to talk to each other. Um, so the only way you can come back from this is to actually delete all the associations and for them to negotiate. Now, don't ask me how this can happen in the wild. I know it does, and I'm willing to blame Raccoon. Ah, <laughs> uh, but that's all I have. So that kind of sucks. Uh, our solution, just do our own liveness checks. It's actually very simple. You just check an own part every once in a while. Are you alive? Yes, fine. Are you alive? Yes, fine. Are you alive? No. Yeah, you know what? I'm going to send you dead. I'm just going to kill all associations. And that's it. And that works very well. Uh, it's very simple when it works. This is what we're doing to work around the problem with this and the problem with half associations. I don't think I need to be saying this, but I'm going to say anyway, instrument the crap out of everything. Uh, you will want your kernel compiled with XFRM uh, stats. I think pretty much all kernels come back, uh, come with that now, but just in case, you should have it. If you want to understand what any of those though do, you're gonna need to look at the kernel source, probably pretty much 100%, uh, but it's definitely worth having it. Um, you can build Raccoon with some uh, timing info, which also is invaluable. This is what the timing info in Raccoon looks like. If there are any problems, you will see very clearly. You can see how long any phase one associations uh, negotiation takes, how long any phase two negotiation takes. You can see how often they happen. It's very, very handy to have. Uh, you can also instrument the association database itself. You can see how many associations you have. This helps us, for example, detect that problem I was talking about earlier with DPD when we were getting hundreds, just per any two hosts, you will very clearly detect it uh, here. Um, this is what the kernel, uh, the kernel um, stats look like. This is what it looks like when that thing with better flexo happens, right? So one server is receiving uh, data that it knows nothing about. Like, I don't know about that security decision. That counter goes up. We look at the graph, we know what happens. If we never had this we could have gone crazy trying to figure out what was happening in the previous scenario. We found it in like five minutes. It's very, very important to have metrics. Be careful with things like MTU. Um, having your traffic being encapsulated by EPSEC has an overhead. So keep that in mind if you have like anything in the middle that's gonna you know, enforce any MTU. Um, there's overhead, especially if you use Docker. Um, Docker will, impo will impose in its own uh, overhead as well. So keep that in mind. We have to trim down um, to use a little bit in some of our Docker containers because that was causing an issue. Path MTU discovery should work, but in practice, it may or may not to just test it. Um, if you can use certs, if you have PKA infrastructure, just use certs, do not even think twice. Uh, otherwise, try to use strong pre-share keys. Try not to go with a simple thing. Enable perfect forward secrecy. And please, oh, please do not aggress do not use aggressive mode. It sounds kind of nice. I want to give aggressive or what? No, it's hard. Um, quick reminder, some of the tools we're all used to having won't work. This is kind of silly and obvious, but this dump won't just work because all the traffic is encrypted. So we'll just, you will just see a bunch of encrypted traffic. You can use tools like Wireshark and T-Shark to decrypt it if you dump the keys in advance. And we used to have a couple of scripts to do that. You can also use NetFilter, um, do a bit of firewall shenanigans um, and get a disappearance dump of the traffic. 
be mindful of the buffer size because you're going to run out of space very very quickly and you can really have uh can really use most of the filters uh also trace route it will try to use udp by default if you were doing the thing we were talking about earlier when you exclude icmp traffic just use uh trace route with uh dash i and that will do it never ever restart raccoon <laughs> never a friend told me not to do it um turns out that all those relationships all those phase one relationships live inside the user space daemon so if you restart it you're basically flushing all your connections away and you're forcing a reconnection right so if you have thousands of them you need to do a thousand of them at once um we used to well not me a friend uh, used to trigger a restart of raccoon every time we will add or remove servers to the fleet um coincidentally a lot of network shenanigans happened around that time um that was that was the reason so if you want to flash an individual say you have tools to do it otherwise you can just tell raccoon to reload its config and it won't flush anything um when adding and removing hosts do not just flush the whole security policy database or security association database what i would recommend you do is let the associations untouch just remove the security policies if there's no security policy telling you to contact host b it doesn't matter if you have an association it will never be used so you don't have to flush the whole thing if you're really paranoid you can just flush it that particular one not everything um that's it so questions Excellent. hey my name Hi. is loris uh, so just a quick question um may be obvious but uh so you said you basically add in place uh check uh you know to to basically monitor your uh, uh, associations and you flush them as soon as the timer yep. it's you know about to expire do you account for packet loss in that moment or you just take out the host from the network somehow you drain it we we do and we don't in that we don't necessarily care like if the network is kind of dodgy i don't care about doing a reassociation anyway uh we do allow for uh a bit of a back off on retries so if we believe that the network is not at its best we don't just you know delete the association right away at the first time of travel uh something that we're adding to the tool right now is actually adding some diagnostic tools that will allow us to actually say there's this amount of packet loss in the link uh because it's definitely something useful and what we do is we have two separate checks one that uses the ipsec a port that uses ipsec one that uses a port that's exempt from using ipsec then we can compare the two and then we can say oh one was failing but the other ones and this is an ipsec issue but not a network issue which is something very important all right thanks very much Thank you. So my name is Dario and I like dogs. You said to share affinities, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, just Sorry. one quick quick question. So my question is more kind of why. So can, did you want want because to do there. this or that was or you were forced to do this? What do you mean forced? I mean, did you want to do this project or you were forced with some uh, weapon to do this? Both. Both. Uh, now, we were using another VPN solution. I didn't touch on that because we were kind of short on time. We were securing our own traffic with an RBPN solution. It was not working very well. Uh, it was working, uh, for example, it had a single point of failure in, I don't know if you know about end-to-end, -end. don't bother looking for it. Um, it has a, a single point of failure in, in its super node and it doesn't perform very well. It was basically being a bottleneck, preventing us from scaling and causing reliability issues. So we needed a way to secure a whole network in a way that performed with some love. So why IPsec? Because IPsec is when you don't control boss ends, which mm -hmm. is in your case, boss ends are your servers, it's probably your own software. Why not TLS SSL? So that was that was that's a very good question. The problem is we don't have just one service, right? So as any probably modern company, we have dozens of services 
they are different. We also run services that we didn't write ourselves. Um, so we will have to secure every single service individually, right? Um, the odds, the, the, the chances of getting one of those wrong or missing one are way too high. And we just wanted to be able to say, everything's secure, all the traffic is secure, everything's fine. I don't want to start having, you know, to run S tunnel everywhere because I'm running Ryak and Ryan MySQL or configuring any of those services individually to be protected because not all of them actually support it. So just as a like follow up to the previous question, what, why not to use the sidecars? Again, TLS everywhere, you just have a sidecar instead of trying to make every like SQL box to know how to do TLS everywhere. Thank you. So you can do that. Um, we kind of wanted to go with the simple solution and getting the problem fixed once and having everything support at once. And that was it. Um, there are other options, sure. Um, what we wanted was to make sure that all the traffic was protected, no matter when it was originated. Um, just building a new service meant it was protected by default. Um, instead of having you know, any extra sidecar or configuration or anything. But other approaches also work. Cool. Um, thank excellent. Thank you very much.